Hello everyone, and welcome to my presentation. Today I will be talking about Icarus, a new attack on low Earth orbit satellite networks. Together with my collaborators, Tommaso, Adrian, and Ankit, we devised the Icarus attack as a cautionary tale on the deployment of these networks. And we hope to convince you that the security and availability of satellite networks is an important and still open problem. Now, let me start with a recap of the characteristics of low Earth orbit satellite networks, or LSNs, that is also very relevant to the story on attacks and defenses I am going to present. The excitement around low Earth orbit satellite networks is obviously very high, both in the networking community and in industry. Even in their current configuration, that is to say only partially deployed and with no intersatellite links, the performance of these networks is extremely appealing, especially because they bring broadband access to rural areas. There are two main takeaways, however, I would like you to keep in mind from this slide. First, the rates at which the terminals for these LEO constellations are already able to send are competitive with broadband. And second, the number of terminals and their four connected user devices will be huge. Five million terminals are contracted to be deployed in the US alone. So this is all great, but if you're a security-minded person, you already start to notice that there might be some trouble ahead. The great properties of LSNs that we've just seen are given by their peculiar structure. In the figure here, we see how these networks operate today. Static and mobile terminals are connected with each other as long as, as they are in the footprint of a single satellite. Each of these satellites can relay up to four gigabit per second in our model. And of course, as the satellites move, the stations on the ground change the satellite they're connected to. In the near future, however, laser links will be added between the satellites. Each of these links will have a higher capacity of 20 gigabit per second in our model. And each satellite will be connected with four intersatellite links to satellites in the same orbit and to nearby orbits. These ISLs are the key innovation that brings low latency to LEO satellite networks. The speed of light in vacuum is in fact faster than in fiber, yielding almost a 50% forwarding speed improvement. And moreover, the satellite paths are often shorter than the, the equivalent terrestrial paths for distances above a few thousand kilometers. Now, here we see the result of the interconnections of ISLs in SpaceX's Starlink Shell 1, one of the constellations that are being built today. As I said before, adding ISLs will provide high bandwidth access to any point on Earth, but also low latency communication at long distances. These characteristics make these networks particularly interesting for a number of different applications, such as high frequency trading, remote augmented reality, cloud gaming, and others. And what's important to notice here is that the users of these applications will be likely connected to the terrestrial internet as well. In this presentation, we therefore look at the satellite network as an enabler for new high-end application and not just a way to connect rural areas. Now, these revolutionary applications enabled by LSNs have attracted a lot of attention from both industry and academia, and for a good reason. However, with this work, we are the first to realize that malicious entities may also share the same interest and attention. The question we are trying to answer is, therefore, how can a malicious party disrupt communication over a LEO satellite network? To better understand the possible threats to LSNs, we devised the Icarus attack. The goal of Icarus is to disrupt communication of hosts over the satellite network. We do not consider attacks that are already known, such as jamming of uplinks and downlinks, or attacks on the weak or inexistent encryption of communication. We are in, instead interested in exploring which attacks are opened by the various innovations that these networks provide. We will thus talk about attacks that hamper ISL connectivity, showing how an adversary can block the communication between two terminals as in the figure. The starting point for our exploration of attacks on intersatellite links is the core melt attack. While traditional distributed denial of service attacks target a server directly, flooding it with packets and exhausting its resources, core melt targets the network infrastructure, congesting the links leading to the server. This is achieved by having compromised hosts, normally called bots, communicate with each other on a path that crosses the target link. This communication is therefore completely indistinguishable from legitimate users. 
core melt is therefore very difficult to detect as to an external observer, there is no victim. Therefore, we asked ourselves, can core melt be applied to the LSN? And throughout our exploration, we discovered that LSNs have three characteristics that make them particularly susceptible to this attack. The first is that LSNs are white box networks. That is to say, the satellite positions and the satellite designs have to be made public. In SpaceX's case, this information must be filed to the FCC. Moreover, this knowledge is sufficient to compute the position of satellites and links for days in advance, thanks to the precision of orbital mechanics. Therefore, the apparent complexity of attacking a moving mesh network is drastically reduced by considering static snapshots of the topology that, be computed in, that can be computed in advance. You can see a representation of these evolving paths in the video on the left. Finally, the routing policy of the satellite network can be discovered. We make this assumption based on the observation that using latency measurements and the topology knowledge, the forwarding path over the satellites can be reconstructed. As we will see later in the presentation, we consider many different routing strategies in the paper and we devise different attacks against all of them. The second characteristic is that LSNs are accessible from all over the planet. This means that the attack can be scattered over wide areas. And moreover, millions of terminals will be available for compromise. Recall that SpaceX requested the deployment of 5 million terminals in the US alone. Further, each satellite is then an entry point to the network to which the adversary can connect. So with this high number of points and the knowledge of the topology, the adversary can carefully plan the attack. And finally, since all terminals need to be equipped with self-locating functionality to acquire the satellite signal, we can also safely assume that the adversary also knows the location of its bots. The third, final, and most important characteristic of satellite networks that sets them apart from their terrestrial counterparts is their cost. At least initially, in fact, the cost of sending traffic over the satellite network will likely be higher. Customers will nevertheless choose to use this connection because it can offer low latency and bounded jitter. For an attack to succeed then, a full disconnection of the network is not necessary. If the adversary manages to deteriorate the latency of the LSN enough to make it higher than the alternative terrestrial path, the LSN user will revert to the terrestrial network. Because if it can pay less for the same performance, why not? Of course, we are now considering the applications we were targeting at the beginning, such as FinTech or cloud gaming. Single home users in remote areas have no choice anyways. The adversary then only needs to create sufficient congestion on a target link, thus adding buffering delay to the satellites. And even if there is a combinatorically high number of paths between two satellites in the satellite network, the adversary can be successful by just moderately congesting the forwarding paths. So given these characteristics, the Icarus attack works as follows. The adversary leverages the knowledge of topology, routing, and bot positions to select sources and destination that will send traffic through the target link. If enough of such flows converge on the same link, congestion occurs and the attack is successful. Such an attack is shown in the figure. To evaluate the effectiveness of this attack, we introduce two metrics. The first is attack cost, which is a proxy for how many hosts the adversary has to compromise to achieve a successful attack. And the second is attack detectability, which measures how much the adversary needs to perturb an uplink to succeed in the attack. And this is captured by considering the maximum number of bots that share the same uplink. Thus, the adversary seeks to minimize this maximum increase, spreading the bots over many different satellite uplinks. You can see the effect of this minimization in the figure. Naturally, the lower cost and the lower detectability, the more effective the attack will be. Of course, the effectiveness of an attack very much depends on the choice of the satellite network's routing strategies, as it changes the way the adversary has to select paths. In the paper, we consider many different possibilities. First, we consider a satellite network that only routes traffic on the shortest path between endpoints. This is clearly a best case scenario for performance. However, constraining flows to a single path is highly predictable and does not make use of the full bandwidth potential of the satellite network. Thanks to this predictability then, the adversary is able to launch many successful attacks congesting more than 99% of the end-to-end -end paths and with very low cost and low detectability, 
meaning that only a few hundreds of bots are necessary for the attack, and each link takes at most a few tens of bots. We then look at the case in which the attacker wants to disconnect two large regions and not just two endpoints. In the example here, we see an attack trying to disconnect Northwestern America from Northwestern Australia. In our experiments, we find that the cost and detectability for this attack are very similar to the single link attacks. We then relax our assumption on the single path routing and introduce load balancing in the satellite network. In this more realistic scenario, we see that the adversary has a cost detectability trade-off, and we will discuss more about this later. Finally, we briefly investigate whether these attacks are worsened by the fact that satellites continuously move and shift their position, creating abrupt changes in the topology of the network. So we have some results about this in the paper, but future work will be needed to analyze these attacks in more detail. Let's now look more in detail at the case in which the satellite network uses randomized load balancing. This is the only case in which we see a deterioration of the adversary's capabilities. To explain why this is the case, we explore four different ways to construct load balancing sets. With this graph, we represent the design space of load balancing sets. On the x-axis, we have path diversity, which is a measure of how much the paths in the load balancing set overlap with each other. On the y-axis, we have a measure of the performance that these paths have as a function of the shortest path latency. Naturally, we would like a load balancing set with very diverse paths, but minimal overlap. Our first attempt at load balancing sets contains the five shortest paths. These, of course, have very low latency and therefore very high performance. However, as you can see in this figure, they share many intersatellite links and therefore they have low path diversity. The second strategy is to use the five shortest paths that do not have intersatellite links in common. This yields a much higher diversity, as we can see, but, but these paths are quite far from optimal. We pick another two strategies similarly, which position themselves as a trade-off between these two extremes. We then run our probabilistic version of Icarus on satellite networks that deploy these different routing and load balancing algorithms. The load balancing algorithms that have high performance and low diversity roughly perform as in the single shortest path case, meaning that they have low cost and low detectability. And this is as expected since the paths in these sets largely overlap with the shortest path. On the other hand, we have our first positive result with the load balancing sets that have high path diversity. As we show in the paper, in these settings, the adversary can only minimize cost or detectability, but not both. Thus, we reach a bittersweet conclusion that the satellite network operator can pay a price in latency and therefore performance to decrease the effectiveness of an attack. However, this decrease is only partial, as the adversary can still obtain an optimal attack for one of the two metrics. In this figure, we can see the probabilistic Icarus attack in operation, where the adversary optimizes for detectability. In the paper, you can find the details of how this probabilistic attack is constructed and optimized. Finally, let me finish this presentation by giving a little hope and discuss possible mitigation. As we've seen for Cormelt, traditional mitigations cannot stop this type of attack. As the attack flows and legitimate flows cannot be distinguished, and therefore any filtering or traceback systems do not apply here. However, there is space for defenses specifically designed for satellite networks. As we've demonstrated with our probabilistic attack, using load balancing sets introduces trade-offs for the adversary. In this paper, we did not explicitly look for the load balancing design that is optimal for the defense of the LSN, but we trust that future research in this direction will bring interesting results. In conclusion, we've seen that the great properties that make low Earth orbit satellite networks so appealing also create threats for their availability. To better study this problem, we devised the Icarus attack, and we showed that this attack is quite powerful with high success rates and low detectability. We also see that the defense is not trivial. So there's definitely a lot of future work possible in this area, both in attacks and defenses, and in exploring how the network dynamics can further exacerbate these attacks, or in the design of resilient routing strategies and topologies. Finally, I want to point out that the, all the experiments and simulations we ran in this paper are carried out on a simulator we built, and this is open source, and we hope it can be the basis for future research. If you want to have a look, check it out on GitHub. And with this, I will end the presentation. Thank you for your attention, and I'm very much looking forward to your questions.